but literature is the only way to understand life better. If you want to become immortal, you will have to stop being human. You can hear the dead people. Hi, I'm Greg Mastrider, and this is a YouTube show on literature, culture, and favorite books of famous people, book first. Today, here with me is Frédéric Begbedet, a famous French writer, publicist, and TV star. Hi, Frédéric. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. Thanks for joining in. I would like to start by discussing, of course, literature. I think its role is significantly uh, being shifted uh, during uh, recent years. People read less, they consume social media more. Are you among those people? Are you a person who started reading less and less gradually over the recent years? Oh, quite the opposite. I uh, I am not on social media. I don't have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, nothing. And uh, I uh, read more and more. I really believe that uh, literature is the only way to understand life better. And we, especially in periods that are crazy like now, we really need yeah. the help of intelligent writers and the history of, of literature is the only solution to save us in this nightmare. So uh, what kind of books would you recommend to cope with uh, such nightmare? What, what do you read to cope with it? I think the, the situation in Russia is quite the same as in France. We are in, a, in our apartments, we are like in a prison. Uh, yeah. not authorized to leave, right? So we should read, uh, for example, Les Carnets du Sous-Sol, the uh, Diary in the Basement by Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he wrote this, the story yeah. of this man that is trapped inside a basement. And it describes, uh, it's a very interesting way to make a positive thing of this Reclusion. Also, you have the same in France, Voyage autour de ma chambre by Xavier de Mestre. It's in English, you could translate uh, traveling around my room. Traveling, mm -hmm. you know, it's the, it's uh, Xavier de Mestre was a um, aristocrat in the 18th century and he, he was in jail and he wrote in jail, he wrote how happy he was staying inside his room. These two books can help now that we are trapped in this absurd uh, present. Thanks for the recommendations. What else is on your bookshelf uh, nowadays? Uh, which books inspire you? This week I'm reading the short stories by Philip K. Dick. Uh, Philip mm. Dick was a, a very important science fiction writer uh, from California. Many of his short stories became movies. For example, Minority yeah. Report or um, Blade Runner, uh, also The Truman Show. He had s so many ideas that became true. In fact, in his novels, he invented the social network, the internet. He imagined virtual life. He imagined that people would have avatars, holograms. And also he imagined that because of these new technologies, <clears throat> people would not need to leave their houses anymore and they would stay. And, and that's exactly what's happened. Since we have this technology, we are using it right now, it, it helps governments to inside our houses. Um, so uh, Philip K. Dick is, very, is a very important uh, writer if you want to understand uh, the world we are now. In fact, he, he invented it. <laughs> uh, do you think it's possible for a modern writer to become such a prophet as uh, Philip K. Dick once used to be? 
because nowadays the world is changing so fast. It's crazy. And uh, is it uh, possible at all to uh, know what comes in 20 or 30 years? Well, uh, all the science fiction and, and fantastic writers, they, they always use science. And if you read the science magazines, like Science or Nature, you can see what's going to be the future. For example, now the uh, genetics, the modification of uh, human beings, the fight against uh, age and, uh, you know, yeah. the, the, all this could, could inspire some writers if they want to imagine the future. Uh, you, Mary Shelley, when she wrote Frankenstein, uh, she imagined that we could bring back to life a dead corpse with electricity, and it became true. Uh, so if you want to imagine the future, just look at science. Well, that's uh, obviously what you do as well with your novel, Une uh, Vie Sans Fun, uh, Endless Life. You definitely got inspired by science, and uh, uh, since you touched upon that topic, uh, have your views on aging and uh, possibly eliminating aging, eliminating death, have your views changed uh, during the recent years following uh, scientific breakthroughs? No, I still think that if you want to become immortal, you will have to stop being human. That's what I understand from the recent discoveries of uh, medicine and science and biology and uh, biotechnology. Uh, so the choice is a short human life or a long post-human uh, life. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you, when you think about it, uh, the vaccine, the Russian, American, and maybe the European vaccine against uh, COVID-19 will make us post-human because it works with genetics. So you will be a little bit different. You, we will become mutants. <laughs> so, so it happens very soon. Everybody will start mutating to a new form of uh, post-humanity. It's a possibility. And uh, that's something that worries me a little bit because I, I like mankind. I think... Uh, I prefer to have a funny, not perfect human life instead of becoming a robot or a computer or a, another animal. Is there necessarily such a radical border between a human and a post-human? You say uh, that uh, we will become cyborgs, robots, but uh, what if we just uh, modify our bodies with vaccines, with the bionic prosthesis, uh, with uh, some other technology to make us healthier, happier, more productive, uh, but remain human. That's uh, usually, that's how scientists explain their work and, and, and they, they all hope to do something for the best, for the better of humanity. But in all the dystopic novels that I love, it starts very well, and then there are problems. <laughs> and so as, as a science fiction writer, because now I, I, I am one uh, since this book, Life With No End, um, I yeah. have to imagine the good things and also the bad things. If you look at, for example, the work of Elon Musk on uh, pigs, he's trying to connect pigs with... Um, computers, you know, and, and connect the yeah. human brain uh, with computer. Um, is it good or bad? You have advantages and you have disadvantages. For example, uh, an advantage is if you have the Wi-Fi in your brain, you will be very clever. You will know everything. But disadvantage is that everybody will, will be able to read in your mind and read your emails check everything you do. You will have no secrets anymore if you're connected to the Wi-Fi. So that's a, a simple example to show 
It's exactly, I mean, every scientific discovery has good things and bad things, like the web. The web is incredible, very positive for some things and very dangerous for others. What would you choose? Privacy uh, over uh, ability to connect to Wi-Fi wherever you go? So you would uh, choose to retain uh, well, privacy, secrecy? The, the, that's a good question because it's going to be difficult if once, once you will have humans that are connected, they will be so much more powerful. They will Superior. be like, yeah, yeah, they will be superheroes. So um, it will be difficult to refuse it because, for example, now I am not on Instagram and I feel already like an old dinosaur <laughs> cut from everything, which I like. In a way, I like to be uh, in Jurassic Park with my old books. But um, but it will be worse once you will have people that are connected to the, the internet and others who are not. So I will feel maybe like an old uh, dinosaur or a, a monkey, <laughs> but a happy monkey, because I will have my secrets. Nobody will be able to know mm -hmm. my private life. Uh, some experts say that Privacy is an outdated concept, and that's, uh, uh, today it is the norm, but it's great, gradually uh, shifting, and uh, the following generations will not need privacy. They, they will feel that it, uh, it used to be the weird uh, preferences of their ancestors. They retained uh, privacy and anonymity. Why hide anything? Why not be 100% uh, <laughs> transparent? Do you think it's a progress? You don't have any... I don't know. Well, for me, uh, what you are saying now is very scary. I'm sorry. <laughs> Because I, I, <laughs> I think we have to protect our, our privacy. It's important. It's what makes us unique. It's, uh, everybody doesn't need to know everything you do uh, during the day. And it's, it's nice also to have secrets, even to be able to lie, is, it's a luxury. And I don't want everybody to know, uh, to know me. So I think it's, it's, uh, this theory is a little bit frightening. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm an old, I'm an okay boomer, you know, I'm an old, uh -huh. but I have children and I, I see that, for example, my daughter, my elderly daughter, she's 21 and she, she's, uh, she's on social media, but she doesn't spend all her day exhibiting her life. She wants to protect herself. And I think now and the few years we are living now, it's the time to resist. So <laughs> I see writing, publishing and, and, and reading literature as a form of resistance mm. because it makes you clever, it makes you remember history, it makes you respect the intelligence of the great genius people who have lived before us. This is what makes mankind interesting. It's uh, to, to listen to the advice of the people who were there before us. Reading Chekhov mm -hmm. is a way of resisting uh, this, this uh, acceleration of, um, mm -hmm. of madness and sometimes stupidity. What about the next generations? Do you think they will still read or will this luxury be lost on them? As a literary critic, a journalist, a TV host and everything, I'm, a f I'm fighting a, a war for taste, for elegance, and for memory. And that's my war. I am a soldier fighting against amnesia. But I don't know if I will win. I don't know. I'm just uh, all day long trying to explain to the young people that if they don't read books, they will be um, stupid. And it's not nice to be stupid. You know, 
doctors always say you have to exercise your body to be healthy. Well, yeah. I say, I say you have to exercise your brain to be intelligent. It's the same. It's gymnastic for the brain. You have to read every day, one hour or two hours to make this exercise for your neurons. Otherwise, if you don't do it, you become stupid and then you become easy to manipulate. Yeah, so that's uh, one way to uh, advance reading. Uh, say that it broadens your mind, develops your intellect, but also emotional intellect, I think. Not just, uh, not just the mind, the, the senses uh, as well. But, yes. And it's true that on the internet you can be very curious and discover many things. And, but, but sometimes you also need to be in a silent room with yourself and the voice of, of somebody that lived 300 years ago that is talking to you. And, uh, you know, and this is, it's also emotional. It's emotions. It makes you laugh, it makes you cry, it makes you angry. But... That's what I uh, call uh, reading. Reading is, uh, is it's like a conversation with the dead. It's incredible if you think about it. Being able to, to go inside the brain of Tolstoy or Turgenev, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's an incredible technology. Uh, this is a victory over death to some extent that mm -hmm. uh, post-humans or transhumanists uh, yes. wants to achieve. Exactly. Uh, by the way, uh, who, whom uh, out of uh, all dead people would you feel more pleased and thrilled to uh, talk to, at least in the book form? Uh, who oh. is your oh. favorite dead person? There's so many, but uh, yeah, well, Charles Baudelaire, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, um, uh, of course, Anton Chekhov. Uh, Chekhov mm -hmm. also wrote about what's happening now, you know. There is a short story called L'Homme à l'étui in French. I don't know the Russian title. It's about a man called Belikov. Belikov, uh -huh. he's afraid. He's very afraid of life. And uh, in, in, the, in this short story, ah, he yeah. died. I know. You know, Belikov. A man, a man in a, in, in yes. a, uh, yes. like a, in a cocoon. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. The man in the cocoon. He's, he's so afraid of life that he ends up, he's only happy when he's dead, you know? And uh, I think Chekhov, he, he was, of course, a um, doctor, so he wanted, he wanted to tell us something. He, he, he was curing people, but also he wanted to tell us stop being afraid of dying because if you're afraid of dying you're afraid of living life is always dangerous you have accidents you have virus you have terrorist attacks and every day if you go out of your house you risk something but you have to take the risk otherwise you are living a non-life that's the message yeah. of Chekhov. So I like to discuss uh, Chekhov. You said Chekhov comes to my house very often. We drink vodka mm -hmm. together. Uh, with I drink I drink mm -hmm. vodka with uh, also Benedict Erofayev. Uh, mm. I drink vodka with uh, Dostoevsky, of course. And we talk about prostitutes in Saint Petersburg. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful to be able to dialogue with all those masters. That's what I. That's what I'm trying to explain. If you look at a library, it's not pieces of paper, it's people, dead people talking to you. Yes, it's a little bit scary. And I'm gonna look like this now. Dead, <laughs> dead people, they are talking to you right now in every bookstore, every library in the world. You can hear the dead people. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> wow, that was really something. Uh, what about modern writers? Uh, whom do you like most? 
French, maybe some Russian modern writers, maybe American well, ones. Well, uh, for example, uh, yeah, Michel Houellebecq in France. It's very mm -hmm. important, realistic and pessimistic. Yeah. I like his humor, very dark. Uh, I like uh, in uh, Russia, um, Pelevin. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I like, um, well, ma ma many, many. Uh, in, in America, Bret Easton Ellis. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, uh, he's, he's kind of cynical, but also uh, he's a very, um, I like his violence. The, he's a violent writer, yeah. makes you react, and I like that. Yeah, um, it's important to read not only the dead, you're right, <laughs> to encourage the, the living also. About modern Russian writers, uh, do you know of, uh, for example, uh, Sergei Minayev, who has been uh, influenced by you, obviously, a lot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a friend. He's a friend we met... Uh, we met many times, uh, and uh, unfortunately, he's not translated in French, and I don't read Russian. Uh -huh. It's a big problem for me because I would like to to read Sergei, but I, uh, yeah, Andre, also my my publisher at Gorodets, is uh, he's, he's translated in French and he's very good. Uh, Andre uh, Gelasimov. Yes. Hmm? He's translated mm -hmm. in French. I like I like his work. Um, it's important because I think Russian and French uh, writers are very close. They have the same kind of uh, pessimism yeah. and romanticism at the same time. And uh, there are many common points. And that's why I think, I mean, a long time ago, um, some Russian writers spoke French. Turgenev was... Mm -hmm close friends with uh, Flaubert. So they, they were, um, it's, uh, it's interesting to know, to, to understand that. The, 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 there is a link between uh, French and Russian literature from centuries ago. Let's play a short game. Uh, you know of uh, Ivan Bunin, mm -hmm. uh, the famous Russian writer, Nobel laureate. Uh, he was uh, kind of famous for uh, having a quick and witty phrase describing any of his uh, famous contemporaries. Uh, he liked criticizing them mostly. For example, uh, he said uh, uh, that uh, Nabokov uh, was a crook and a tongue-tied phrase monger. And he had similar phrases for many other uh, writers. In this game, like Bunin, I ask uh, guests of the show to give uh, short uh, descriptions to some uh, of the great writers of the former times or of contemporary times. Not necessarily criticism, not necessarily 100% uh, like Bunin. So, uh, short description, one phrase. Let's start with uh, Victor Hugo. Uh, you know, uh, I would say, like André Gide said that, uh, the best poet, the best French poet, hélas. Uh, but I don't know how to translate hélas in English. The, the best French poet, unfortunately. Ah, hélas, yes, there is such a word. But why, why unfortunately? Because it's, it's so big, so important. Uh, he, he was, you know, very engaged in politics and... Uh, we wish we could say that it's not interesting, but we can't. It's uh, always annoying when s somebody is such a genius that you cannot escape him. You cannot escape Victor Hugo in yeah. French. It's impossible to escape. You, you have to love him, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I wish I was free yeah. and I could say it's shit, but I, can't. I, I would lie. Okay. Uh, Honoré uh, de Balzac. Also... Um, a, a huge monument for every novelist since Balzac uh, wrote uh, the way of writing novels has has changed he has invented the novel the classic novel mm -hmm. the realistic novel but it's not a short sentence I have to find a short sentence well he was as big 
physically as morally. Okay. Gustave Flaubert. Because of him, uh, French writers leave Paris. <laughs> Because he left Paris. And so now it, it, that's what I did three years ago. I left Paris. It's, the, it's mm -hmm. Gustave's fault. <laughs> so he's a trendsetter uh, in exactly. that regard. Yes. Okay. Marcel Proust. Marcel Proust. Uh, well, um, it's difficult to criticize all those masters. He's the proof that you can be a superficial person for the first half of your life, a snobbish mm -hmm. nightclubber, and then in the second part of your life, use that material to become the greatest writer of the 20th century. For people like me who like to go out, Proust is an excuse to get drunk and imagine someday you will <laughs> use it and make something great out of all those parties. Well, that's a life hack. Now that I'm on a party, I can say that I'm following <laughs> Marcel exactly. Proust's advice. Exactly. Marcel Proust yeah. is it's a good excuse to, to go out and uh, talk with uh, superficial people because that's what he, he loved. And he used it and made it beauty. Louis Ferdinand Céline. He's, Bunin said uh, crook, but Céline is not a crook. Céline is, a, is both a monster and a genius. It's, you can be both. And very often, uh, good writers are bad people. That's, a very, that's very important uh, to say. I mean, r good writers don't have to be good people, saints or heroes. They, they don't. They, they just have to be good when they write. That's, that's all we ask to them. Michel Houellebecq. Uh, Michel Houellebecq is the, is the Céline of the 21st century. But he's a better man than Céline, I think. He's a humanist. He's kind and gentle and, and soft. He's not a violent person. He's not a dangerous person, Michel. But uh, yeah, he, what I love about Michel is he, he has talent to make to say cruel things in a short and funny way that makes them acceptable. One last name, Frédéric Begbeder. A crook, definitely crook, crook, crook. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, please tell me what are you working on right now? You have a new novel coming out in France next year, right? I hope to be able to finish Un Roman Français, Tome 2. The following, you know, like you, after Star Wars, you got The Empire Strikes Back. And I wrote yeah. a French novel 10 years ago, and I want to do the following of a French novel. So it's a book about my uh, adolescence. I want to go back to the world of my 20s the 80s and 90s. You know, when you are not allowed to go out and you have to write, the best thing to do is remember. That's what I'm doing now. I'm just remembering the times when I was 20 years old. I had nothing else to do than uh, fall in love with many different girls. <laughs> and, uh, and I was organizing parties in Paris. Now that parties are forbidden, You have drones in Paris looking at citizens and uh, the police is arresting people when they shake hands. They are, uh, if, if you kiss a girl, you have a, you have a fine. So right now, when I look at my, my 20s, I, it's, it's like paradise. It's a lost paradise. I can imagine. One last question. Tolstoy or Dostoevsky? Ah, it's, that's too, it's very difficult. I think I'm too impressed by Tolstoy. So I would say Dostoevsky because it, he, 
his universe, his contradictions, the, the paradox, you know, the, the attraction to God, but also the guilt of being a weak and, and, and dirty human being. Paradox, these contradictions uh, touch me more, maybe. But I, I, I admire Tolstoy like any writer, anybody who calls himself a writer has to worship Tolstoy, of course. But I think Dostoevsky moves me more. I see. Thank you so much, Frederick. Uh, I hope you will be organizing parties in Paris sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. I hope so too. And also in Moscow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you.